All right, Two Cities Church, if you are new, we are a a two-and-a-half-year-old church that two-and-a-half years ago, uh, 30 of us moved from the Raleigh-Durham area, from the Summit Church, to plant Two Cities Church, and a lot's happened in the last two-and-a-half years. We've grown numerically and spiritually and organizationally, and today we celebrate six months in this facility. You can clap about that. Yes. We've now... We've now been doing four services for six months. I want to thank you guys for serving and giving and praying for our staff, for our volunteers. It's really been incredible. And we've always said that the building, the facility was there to facilitate ministry. It wasn't an end in itself. It was a means to something deeper, which is deeper discipleship and wider mission. More and more people meeting Jesus and making disciples. And I say that because every time we have a weekender, and we've been having them about every four weeks now, and uh, people write down their stories of what God's doing in their life. And I want to share with you one of them. This, uh, a young lady wrote this this past weekender about her story. Judges week two made me attend two cities. Judges week four made me stay. And I don't remember what that was about, okay? Uh, <laughs> made her stay. And judges week five made me believe. During hearing about the call of Gideon, something clicked and I was like, wow, this is real. Jesus Christ is real. And I've been coming and learning ever since, and I've been changed, and I want to be baptized. What an incredible story. That is the bullseye. We want to see people who are far from God but close to us meet Jesus and have their lives changed and transformed. Let's pray for this young lady, and let's pray for all the people in our city. Pray with me. Lord, we just are so grateful. Every time we hear a story of somebody meeting Jesus... And having their heart changed, their life changed, their destiny changed, their lineage, their legacy. It's going to influence not only them, but their family and their children. And everybody who's meaningfully connected to them. We thank you, Jesus, that you don't just forgive sin, but you change lives. And we thank you for all of this in your name. Amen. Well, you can open up your Bibles to 1 Peter. We are in 1 Peter. It's a small book at the end of your New Testament. And here's what you need to know. Jesus had three best friends. Maybe you've got, you're like, I don't have that many best friends. Well, Jesus had three best friends. Um, he had a James, he had Peter, he had John. And, uh, and two of his best friends wrote books of the Bible. And we're looking at 1 Peter. We're spending three or four months looking at this. And here's what we're finding, that Jesus, one of his nearest and dearest friends, is writing a book about him and what it looks to live uh, as a Christian faithfully in the world. Um, the big idea for our series is not our home. And, and here's the idea. It's that we are to be people of the kingdom in a culture that is pagan. Let me just explain that. We're people of the kingdom. In other words, the biggest thing, uh, our uh, kind of statement is Jesus Christ is Lord. And we live in a culture where every individual says, no, I'm Lord. And, and we live in, in, under an eternal kingdom and king, Jesus Christ and his reign. But we live in a temporary culture. And this... Um, this book is written to tell us how can we be faithful, how can we be fruitful in this culture. Uh, last week we looked at we have to understand who we are. We're misunderstood missionaries. We're, we're uh, elect exiles, all of that language. This week, um, it's going to deal with a, a different topic. We're going to be in verses 3 through 12 if you want to kind of find where we're going to be. We're going to cover these 9 or 10 verses. And, and here's what we're going to be looking at. This is what I love about the Bible. The Bible uh, is not sugar-coated. The Bible is not idealistic. Uh, the Bible takes the toughest issues in life and goes directly head on at them. And what we're going to talk about today and what the Bible's going to be very honest about is this, and this is kind of probably the big idea for today. Life is hard. Trials are coming. God is good. That would be, that's really the summary. We're going to unpack all of that, but that life is hard. And what's, we live in a culture today where for some reason we don't expect life to be hard. It's like, why do we expect to be healthy all the time? Why do we expect all of our relationships to go well? Why do we expect to always have enough money to do whatever we want to do? And we probably don't even realize we expect all these things until they don't begin to happen. And so what we're going to look at today and what Peter is going to tell us is he's going to say, being a Christian is about living a distinct and different life, but this is the problem that well, we don't want to hear. And here's what he's saying. Here's the big idea for today. What separates you is how you suffer. That's what separates you from the world. What makes you distinct and different is not what you do when everything's going well, but what you do when your marriage is falling apart and your kids are acting crazy and you can't pay your bills and you have chronic pain. 
It's like, is Jesus Christ real then? The answer is yes, but we're going to walk through what that looks like. I want you to read with me just verses 3 through 7 to begin with. Here's what Paul says, or Peter says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, it's kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse six, I believe, is key. I think it's the key to understanding this whole passage. In this you rejoice, what? That you've received mercy, that you're born again, that you have an inheritance, that your soul is safe and secure because of what Christ has done. But what he's going to say is your soul is safe and secure, but nothing else is on this earth. Your marriage isn't. Your health isn't. Your finances aren't. And so he's going to write this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, that's your life, eight, nine, ten decades, whatever it is, for a little while, if necessary, so that's the idea of purpose, you have been grieved, it's not easy, by various trials, literally meaning multicolored trials. Then there's a purpose, verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's what the Bible says, that there are always various trials in life. Either you have been through one, you're going through one, you will go through one. And what I've found in my life is that even the people who it seems like their life's going very well, they seem healthy, they seem wealthy, they seem happy, they seem to have good marriage, they seem to have good kids. If you really get to know them, you ask a few questions, it's usually they're one relationship away or somebody in their family is suffering. And then you've got to ask the question, well, what's worse, you suffering or somebody you love suffering? It's like a lot of people say, well, I'd probably rather suffer than my kids suffer. So, the, and, and here's another thing, the more people you decide to love, the more suffering you are welcoming into your life. And that's okay, that's a good thing. But in a church of our size, somebody every week is always suffering. One of the, one of the best things about being in, in full-time ministry is I get to hear the good news in people's lives, probably more than most people, but the, the hard thing about ministry is I get to hear the bad things in people's lives more than most people probably. And so there are many types of trials. Now there's trials that are uh, different in duration, there's trials that are different in intensity, there's trials that are different in type. But whenever you're going through the trial, let's be honest, whenever you're going through it, it's a big deal to you, right? That's why there's a saying, minor surgery is surgery someone else is having. <laughs> if I'm having it, there's no such thing as minor surgery, it's a big deal. Uh, so let me tell you the types of trials there are. There are physical trials. Some of you, you're like, I'm always in pain. I, I have chronic pain. I take medicine, I don't know why, it's not working. I feel like I'm in and out of hospitals. I've changed doctors. Illness and injury have been a part of my life or a part of somebody's life that I love. Maybe it's even disability. Some of you, it's not physical trials, um, it's relational trials. You're like, I had a terrible marriage and I don't have a marriage anymore. I'm single again. I was betrayed, I was abandoned, I was abused. My, maybe, maybe it's my, my, my marriage is very difficult right now. Maybe it's my kids are killing me. Maybe it's I, my coworkers, my boss. Work, you know, I, I heard a pastor say one time, your life is usually only as good as the relationships you're connected to. And some of you, you feel that. It's like the relationships are the best part and the worst part of your life. And so it's saying, well, there's relational struggle, struggles, there's, finan or there's uh, physical struggles, um, there are emotional and mental struggles that we have. Emotional often comes when you're not suffering, maybe someone you love suffering. There's also mental problems. You could have a broken body or you could have a broken brain. And some people do, and they, I'm not joking, they have a broken brain. I'm schizophrenic, I'm bipolar, I'm depressed all the time, severely de clinically depressed. I, have, I, I struggle with anxiety attacks. I, mean, just, I have a lot of things that I don't know how to deal with them. For some people it's financial. It's like I've got a lot of debt. Um, you know, I don't know how to pay for everything. I, I, I feel like the conversation that me and my husband are always having is how finances are determining everything in our lives, not for good. We feel like we can't have kids. We feel like we can't take a break. We feel like we both have to work, whatever it is. 
These are real things. And I love how the Bible is going to be very honest with us. Some of us, and this is uniquely for Christians, it's spiritual trials. It's I feel uniquely tempted. I have certain temptations. Uh, I have certain, there's demonic activity. There's persecution by Christian, uh, non-Christians. There's uh, oftentimes you feel like the dark, what, the, what Christians have historically called the dark night of the soul. You feel like where's God in all this? I know I love God, but I, can't, I, I feel like I can't see God right now. And what Peter's writing is, is, his point in writing is twofold. Basically, don't be surprised when they happen. Expect to get sick. Expect relationships to be difficult. I mean, we live in a sinful, broken, fallen world. That's kind of the sober-mindedness of it. But then he's going to say, there's a lot of grace. Jesus Christ is going to walk through you. And I'm going to teach you how to walk, walk through this. And he does that because if not, then what happens is, let me tell you how people normally respond to trials. Uh, they get very angry at God. They're like, you know, God, why me? It's interesting because you'll see, it, when a tragedy happens in our nation, the paper says, where was God? But the paper never says, where was God when things are going well? And I think the reason is because we're more sensitive to negative emotion than positive emotion. You can only be so happy. Right? You think about it, like, yeah, I, I can only be so happy. You could be very, 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 very sad. You can go very, very dark places. So people ask those questions. So people get angry at God. People get resentful toward each other. This is what happens. If you don't respond properly in your trial, you start being bitter and resentful and revengeful toward people who aren't going through it. Why are they healthy? How can they afford private school? Why do they seem to enjoy their job and make enough money and have enough time off? Why are their kids, you know, obedient? Whatever it is. And you begin to do that. And then, and then thirdly, and this happens all the time, is then you run toward your idols. You often don't know. So there's an old saying, suffering introduces a man to himself. So you haven't got to know yourself until you've suffered. And then you may not like where you run. And, I, and I've been in counseling appointments with people before. It's like, well, yeah, I never looked at porn until my marriage fell apart. It's like, well, it's, 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 there's a trial coming up, and I respond sinfully to suffering. You know, you get out of a relationship, you run into another unhealthy relationship. You start overeating. You start getting drunk. You start just sleeping all the time because you don't know how to. You start entertaining and amusing yourself to death. And what Peter wants to do is he wants to say there's a better way than being angry and resentful and sinful. And I want to show it to you today. I want to show you the five things that Peter says you can do, should do, must do in every trial. Let's look at them verse by verse. And all of these will arise right out of the text. We never, I'm not here to give my advice, but God's word. And so here's what, we're, here's what it says. Verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the first thing you need to do. You need to worship God before the trial. Now we always talk about blessed. You see that here? Blessed be, we would normally think of it, blessed be me. You know, because we always talk about how blessed we are. Hashtag blessed. Okay. That's kind of a thing today, right? It's like, yeah, we are so blessed. And I get what people mean by that. You know, I'm blessed to have this great marriage. or I'm blessed this car. Or, you know, God's really blessed me with a great job. And, and that's real. And, and I get that. But in this passage, it's not talking about God blessing us. It's talking about us blessing God. Look, here's what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed means joyful, glad worship toward God. And then I want you to see why can we worship God. And this is so important. Verse 3 tells you why you can worship God joyfully because the things that are mentioned in verse 3 don't change even when your marriage falls apart. Even when you get sick. These things are so foundational and fundamental they never change. Because here's what happens. Um, when a trial comes into your life, you'll find out what you really worship. Was I really worshiping health? Because then if I lose my health, it will destroy me. Was I really worshiping my spouse? Because if we're arguing all the time and we're not getting along, that will destroy me. Do I worship my kids? So when they go to college, it destroys me. Here's what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his, here's two things, according to his great mercy... Now, what is God's mercy? It's different than God's grace. They're sometimes used interchangeably, but here's the idea. God's grace is giving you what you don't deserve. I'm going to give you forgiveness. I'm going to give you heaven. Um, I'm going to give you a, a resurrected body. I'm going to give you eternal life. It's God giving us what we don't deserve. That's grace because of what Christ has done. Mercy is God not giving us what we rightly deserve, which would be his judgment, 
which would be the consequences of our sin immediately coming to us, which would be death and which would be hell, to name a few. And so what, what he's saying is you can rejoice because your greatest problem has already been taken care of in Jesus Christ. And then he says this, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. The main reason we worship God is he has made us spiritually alive. And if you're in this room and you're not spiritually alive, give your life to Christ, give yourself and give your sin to Christ because you can't fight all, the rest of the things we're gonna say today. Uh, you can't walk through trials in the way the Bible tells you to if you're not spiritually alive. And so he says this, being born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the first thing he says, you need to worship God before the trial. Secondly, you need hope through the trial. And this is probably the biggest idea. If there's one word that stands out here, it's this idea of living hope. Here's what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to what? To a living hope. Because why? What is the hope? The hope is the person of Jesus Christ risen, reigning, and promising to return. That's the great hope. That's why he says, um, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, whenever we talk to people about, hey, you know, we have a living hope, Christians always go, mm-hmm. They, they make the listening noise, mm-hmm. But do we really, if we're really, really honest, and if I could just ask you, I know, you know, being honest, church is no place to be honest, but if we could just for a moment, okay? <laughs> if we could just for a moment ask the question, where is your hope really? And pause, that's important. Where is your hope, dot, 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 really. You know, because a lot of people, if they're really honest, it's like, here's my hope. I would like to get married. That's kind of my central hope. Or my, here's my hope. I would like to have kids. Or here's my hope. I would like to, um, I'd like to be rich, not rock star rich, just, just normal rich, rich enough to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. Um, um, I, I, I want to, I'd like to retire. I want to be financially free and able to retire and preferably at a young age so I can kind of do whatever I want to do the last 25 years of my life before I meet Jesus Christ face to face. For some people, it's like, here's what I need. I, okay, um, what I really am hoping for is revenge. And don't think that you're beyond that. If you're like, if you're like I don't want revenge, yes, you do, probably. And probably somewhere, if you're, if you're really honest with yourself. You'd be surprised how passively aggressive people, you, how you can deal with that kind of stuff with revenge. Some people, it's like, I want recognition. I'm hoping to one, one day my kids will, will know all I've done for them. One day my husband will respect me. One day everyone will know how smart I am. One day my coworkers will see and I'll get the raise and I'll get the money and I'll... And see, here's the problem with... Most of us are hoping in things the Bible doesn't promise us. Those aren't... Not, everything I purposely... Nothing I mention is bad. I hope you get married. I hope you have kids. I hope you can retire... I hope you can be normal rich, you know, whatever. <laughs> but what, what that is, well, the reason I bring them up is because we're often hoping in things the Bible doesn't promise. I'll give you an example. The Bible does not promise marriage. And, and I've got a, and she gave me permission to say this, I've got a friend, there's a lot of single women in our church, and one of the single women in our church told me, she said, um, I don't like it when people tell me that they're sure God's going to give me a, a spouse. And, and uh, in, you know, even though statistically 90% of you will still get married, you know, even though people are getting married later, everybody's still getting married, most people. So 90% of people still get married. But she said, even with those statistics, I don't like when people say, I know God's going to give you a husband because I don't have a, I don't ha it's not a biblical promise. And she's right. And it's like, we've got to give people bigger hopes than that. We have to give them a living hope. So here's how this works. Uh, and, and I think one of the best illustrations of the importance of a hope outside of this world um, shows up in, in Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, he wrote a book after he got out of Auschwitz, out of Nazi Germany and out of the concentration camps. And he wrote a book about how people in Auschwitz dealt with suffering. And it's hard to imagine a worse situation to be in than that one. And he said there were four ways people responded. He said some people responded um, by just being brutal and cruel. Basically, they lost all hope and they decided, well, we're just, this is dog eat dog. I'm going to fight for the food. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn you in if it'll put me up higher in the whatever. I mean, I'm going to do whatever I need to. He said, some people 
He said, and this was not uncommon to see, is they would completely lose hope. So instead of becoming cruel, they would completely give up. He said, it wouldn't be uncommon for your roommate just one day to go, I'm not getting up. I'm not showering. I'm not going out to the field. You, I'm dying anyway. I'm not doing anything anymore. And we would basically just give up on life. He said the third thing, and he said the people that made it through Auschwitz um, most su successfully at first, he said, was the people who said, okay, here's what's going to happen. I've got to get through Auschwitz because if I can get on the outside, I'll pull my family back together. I'll pull our finances back together. We'll restart the business and we'll do all the things we were doing before all of this terrible stuff happened. And he said what happened is the people got out and almost none of them could restart their lives. Germany had just, so much had changed. Um, and they were never able to, and family, someone died, and they weren't able to pull their family back together. And they weren't able to start their finances back up. They weren't able to restart their businesses. And he said those people struggled the worst type of depression. Many of them became suicidal. And then Viktor Frankl said the only people that he saw long-term make it, this is his words, were those who had a hope beyond this world. Those who had a fixed reference point, something unchanging beyond this world to which this world could not take it away. And we know that hope to be Jesus Christ. And not only that, it tells us not only do we have a hope, but we also have an inheritance. I want you to look with me at the next verse, verse four. To an inheritance, and this inheritance is so amazing that all Peter can do is tell us what it's not. He's like, uh, it's an inheritance that's imperishable. It can't perish. It's undefiled. And it's unfading. And it's kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith. And this is interesting. What are we guarded from? Are we guarded from trials? No, we're guarded from sin and unbelief in the midst of our trials. That's what it means for our faith to be guarded. I still believe God, even though life is very hard for me right now. He says, guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What he says is, we have two things. We have a living hope, the person of Jesus Christ, and a reward and inheritance. It's okay that God... Um, motivates us through reward. It's one of the motivations. We'll talk more about this next week, but God motivates us three ways in the Bible, primarily. Love of God, fear of God, rewards of God. And, and this inheritance, I love what John Newton said. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. He said, uh, talking about the idea of an inheritance, he said, he said, Christians are like those people who had nothing. And then we found out that we had this incredible inheritance Billions and billions and billions of dollars. He said, he said, and what happens throughout the Christian life, though, is he says, what, most, what happens for most Christians, he said, he said, it'd be like this. He said, it'd be like you were in a carriage heading to your massive inheritance in this massive palace or mansion or castle, and you're about half a mile from the castle, and your carriage breaks down. He says, and then you walk, and you stub your toe, and, and, and he says, and, and as you're walking to the house, which you can see in the distance, to this massive inheritance, you start, you start complaining about your broken carriage and your hurt foot not realizing there is a massive inheritance that you're about to receive. And so he begins to talk about the importance of an inheritance. Now, here's one of the unique things about an inheritance. An inheritance, if you've ever known somebody who is connected to a wealthy family, part of a wealthy family, and so they're going to receive a huge inheritance, none of us like those people, okay? No. <laughs> Some of you are like, uh-oh, that's me. Um, um, but what's interesting about those people, and, I, and I've got a few friends like that, What's interesting about those people, if they're rightly oriented in the world, if, if, they, if they're, and they're, they're not taking it, they're not being lazy because of it, because that's actually one thing that can happen. You can have an inheritance and be lazy, and that's not good. That's not what the Bible says for inheritance. But the best people who have inheritance, they basically know this. Because I know I've got something safe and secure, I can go take some risks that other people can't take. And I think that on a spiritual level, that's what it means. Because I know that my soul is safe, my reward's in heaven. I'm going to be with Christ forever. I can take risks for Christ on this earth. Amen. It's like what John Wesley said. John Wesley said something like, I'm immortal and invincible until the Lord takes me. And it was just this confidence to preach the word and, and to live. And so we should, we should be confident. The way we say it here is we should take personal risks to bring Christ to every relationship. Personal risks to bring Christ to every relationship. So he says you've got to worship God before the trial. You've got to hope in God during the trial. And here's the third one. You need to know there is a purpose in your trial. 
See, just to go back to the concentration camps for a minute, one of the things that made the concentration camps, and this has been documented, so difficult, among everything else, was how meaningless everything was there on purpose. So in other words, they would make you dig a hole in the ground and then fill that same hole up the whole day. They would say, hey, take this 100-pound salt bag and walk it across the compound and then pick it back up and bring it back here and that's all we're going to do all day. And it wasn't just the suffering, it was the meaninglessness of it. It's the, is this accomplishing anything? What is the purpose of this? And I want you to read with me. There is always a purpose in suffering. Look at verse six. In this you rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary. In other words, there is a purpose. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now listen, it doesn't say that you will know the purpose of the trial in the moment or even in this lifetime. I mean, even Romans 8, 28, probably the most famous verse on this, says, um, we know that all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It says we know all things work together, not that we see everything working together. It's the idea that you really believe that everything that happens in our life is ultimately father-filtered. That, that God sees it, and, and it's very, very difficult. And listen, you're, you're going to drive yourself mad trying to figure out why it's happening. And what you're going to find out is, and then what we end up doing, because I've seen this and I've done this myself, then you start thinking it's all about you. Well, the Lord must be really getting me ready for something. What if it's not even about you? What if it's about your neighbor watching you suffer and trust Christ in the midst of it? What if it's about somebody in your family seeing you walk through a really difficult marriage and put, put it, staple it back together? We, we just become, and maybe it is about you. Maybe there is something, but I'm just saying, we, we don't even know. We, there's so many different categories. Let me give you just quickly some purposes and trials from the Bible. These are just some. Um, to wean you from worldliness. To make you realize my hope is not in this world. C.S. Lewis said pain is God's megaphone. To reveal to you what you really love. Sometimes suffering is a grace because it lets you know, oh man, I really love money. I really love comfort. I really love my job. I really love health. I don't really love God, or not primarily. Sometimes it's to enable you to help others. I think that's a major one. All the time when somebody comes up with some type of suffering and they're saying, my marriage is terrible, you know what I'm thinking? Who's been through a terrible marriage and survived it? When someone's like, you know, we're, and this happens often, they kind of sheepishly will come up to me and say, you know, because it's kind of a, something that people don't talk about, they'll say we're infertile. We can't have kids. We've been trying. Well, I think, well, you, don't, you have no idea that I can connect you to five people in our church right now that have struggled with that. That could, that, that could minister to you because hurting people want to be ministered to by hurting people who've often been hurt in the same ways but have trusted God in the midst of it. And so sometimes your greatest sin struggle, your greatest suffering, your greatest weakness, your greatest temptation, get ready for it, will become your greatest ministry later if you'll be faithful in it. So that's another reason. Here's another one. Uh, to produce endurance in you. That every time you face a, a, a trial, your soul becomes stronger. To often to humble you. But here, I want you to see in verse 7 the pr- purpose that Peter gives you. I just gave you a few other ones. Here's what purpose, or Peter says. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold. So what he says is, he says, your faith is like gold. And back then, the, way, the only way they could tell if gold was real was put it in the fire. Very simple. So it's like, is this real gold? I don't know. Let me put it, expose it to a lot of heat. They pull it out. They go, oh, it's real gold or it's not real gold. So here's the idea. A false faith won't make it through the fire. Or another way to say it is um, a faith that can be tested is a faith that can be trusted. But you don't know you have real faith until it's been tested. Now, Now this is the book of James, for example. You don't have to turn there. The book of James talks about three types of faith. It says there's dead faith, which is faith that has no works. It's faith that doesn't affect your will. You often don't know that until trials come. And then he said, there's demonic faith. So there's dead faith. Then there's demonic faith. Demonic faith, he says, even the demons believe in God and shudder. Here's what it is. It's faith that doesn't affect your emotions. Or that you don't have the correct emotions toward. Does the, 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 demons know more theology than you do. <laughs> but they don't love it. They don't embrace it. It doesn't affect them emotionally. And then he said, there's dynamic faith. It's faith that is real. It's a faith that can suffer. It's a faith that can walk through it. And so here, here's how this works. The best story I've ever heard about this personally there was a pastor, and he was, this is in America, and he lost 
His, his, uh, he was a conservative, Bible-believing, theologically conservative, Bible-believing, teaching pastor. And because of that, he lost his building. He lost his church. Um, he lost his retirement. He lost his salary. And he lost his friends. And his whole network of pastors, because he was a conservative, Bible-preaching uh, pastor. And I saw this interview with him, and it was so powerful. He said, when I lost my retirement, imagine that, some of you. I lost my retirement, I lost my salary, I lost my building, I lost my career, I lost my church. He said, when I lost all that, and I still believed, he said, I was like, I'm a real Christian. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But he said, I did not know it until I had to go through some things. And that's gonna happen, whether it's your kid gets sick, or your marriage has a difficult season, or you lose your job, or illness and injury come to you in some, some way. And you've got to begin to wrestle and ask these questions. And I, and I want to show you something that's so powerful. If you, if you look on in verse 7, it says this. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation. That means the second coming, the revealing of Jesus Christ. He's currently invisible, but that's only currently and temporarily. One day he will be revealed from heaven. But I want you to look what it says, because you almost can't believe it. This is why I love to preach verse by verse, because you have to see it here. It says, when Jesus Christ returns, look, he may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's what it's saying. It's not saying that when Jesus Christ returns, we're going to praise him. Now, it says that other places, and that's true. If you read verse 7, all the commentaries agree. What it's saying is at the return of Jesus Christ, he is going to praise you for being faithful and having faith during your trials. It's mind-blowing, but it's biblical, if you think about it. Because Matthew 25 says, that's the whole parable of the sheep and the goats. What, how does it end? Well done, my good and faithful servant. And this is... Such a powerful reality. It's, it's like the image in my mind is at the end of time, Jesus Christ looks at you, and, and everybody has different situations, and he says, I know you were a diabetic your whole life. You got it when you were young, and, and, or you've had some kind of chronic illness all your life, but you trusted me in it and through it. Well done, good and faithful servant. I know that your kid has a disability. Man, was that hard. And you trust and you walked with him through that? And you still believe that I was good in the midst of that? Well done, my good and faithful servant. I know it was difficult to be single or it was difficult to be infertile. And you had that for years and years and years. And I just want to say, well done. I know your dad died when you were young. And so you had to deal with that. Or I know, I know that you, were th you're, you went through an incredibly difficult marriage. In fact, you lost your marriage. And I just want to say, you are faithful. You trusted me in the midst of it. Well done. That, that's the idea. It's the idea that one of the rewards that the Christian gets is the praise of Jesus Christ for trusting him and being faithful to him in the trial and on the other side of it. That's what it's saying. It's saying you know you're a Christian because in the trial you're believing God still, and on the other side of the trial you're believing God still. So he says, we have to worship before, we have to hope during, we have to know there's a purpose in, and then verse seven will continue, you need to know Jesus is with you in the midst of your trial. At the end of verse seven, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and then verse eight says this, and when I read verse eight and nine, and I wanna read this to you, it's impossible for me to think of the Christian life as anything other than a dynamic, emotional relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not intellectually assenting to things. It's not rich rituals and routines and religion. Uh, it, it may make some of you feel uncomfortable. The emotional language that is used about Jesus Christ, but we should not be more excited about sporting events or Netflix series than Jesus Christ. Every once in a while someone's like, I'm not very emotional. I'm like, I saw you watch that football game. Yes, you are. <laughs> Okay, here's what it says. Though we have not seen him, that means physically. 
The way that people see Jesus Christ is by faith, and faith is the eyesight of the soul. That's the definition of faith. It's the ability to see the invisible world according to the written word of God. That's the definition of faith. So here's what it says. Though you have not seen him physically, you love him. That's emotional language. Though you do not see him. So two different times, Peter's like, look, guys, I get it. I saw him, you didn't. I get it. I spent three and a half years with him. I get it. I saw the resurrected Christ. We spent 40 days after the resurrection. I get it. I saw him. You've not seen him. You do not see him. You believe in him. And remember, verse six said, you're grieved by trials. The Christian life is a mingling of emotion. It's not sometimes I'm sorrowful, sometimes I'm joyful. It's usually I'm always kind of a mixture of sorrowful and joyful because I know people are suffering because I love people deeply because I know this isn't my home. So here's what he says. You believe in him and you rejoice with joy. That's like double joy. Rejoice with joy (laughs) that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now that's interesting. It's not a shallow joy because glory literally means, that word means heavy or weightiness. The glory of God is his weightiness. It's how heavy he should be and the gravity he should have in our lives. And so it's like this is a joyful, deep, weighty joy. And then he says this. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. See, a false gospel will tell you that Jesus Christ is here to fix all your temporary earthly problems. That's a false gospel. The true gospel says Jesus Christ will walk with you in the midst of your sin and suffering. And he's invisible to you physically, but you can see him with the eyes of faith. And one day he will be revealed and reward you. It's like, what's better than that? Jesus Christ is going to walk with you in all of your trials. I was talking to someone after the first service and I was reminded he had gone through cancer and you know, he had told me that every time he went in that room by themselves, because I guess the doctor leaves, there's radiation, there's a bunch of other things, he'd have to be in a room all by himself. You know, if, it's like, who wants to be in a room all by themselves getting radiation? You know, and, and he, said, he said, I would lay there. He said, I would pray. He said, I was so scared at times. You know, it's just like, I don't want to go through all this. There's recovery. There's, and he said, I would be there and Jesus Christ would be right next to me. That, that's the idea, that Jesus Christ walks with us in the midst of our trials. Finally, we must know the word of God in our trials. And this is where he ends. Because the way that you see Jesus Christ is in the scriptures. You need to know the word of God in your trial. I want you to see verse 10. I want you to see how the Bible is talked about. The Bible is not a religious text. Primarily, it's, it's not a, a bunch of random stories. It's not a bunch of pithy statements that look good on your Instagram account or something like that. Um, it is, I want you to see, it is the story of salvation. Look at verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied, that would be Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all of the Old Testament prophets, Malachi, your whole Old Testament. They're saying the whole Old Testament is about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Look at me. The prophets who prophesied about the grace. Some people go, the Old Testament's about law, the New Testament's about grace. No, it's all about grace. So it's about the grace that was to be yours. Search and inquire carefully. In other words, what it's saying is you live at a privileged point in history. That you know things, can see things, can read about things that the prophets did not know and they wanted to know. Then it says this, verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ, that's the Holy Spirit, in them was indicating when he predicted, and here's the key phrase, the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Here's what this is saying. The main theme of all of Scripture is Jesus Christ suffering, dying, rising from the dead. That's what everything is anticipating and pointing to. And afterwards, everything is explaining. And here's why that's such a big idea. If you understand that the main theme of Scripture, in fact, it culminates in a God who suffers for us, we should not be surprised when suffering comes to us. It's like we worship and follow a guy who died violently, tragically, innocently, unjustly after betrayal and abandonment by his close friends, he's crucified. We worship a guy who's crucified and we're like, I don't know why I'm being criticized. 
We should not be surprised. Jesus warned us. He said, if they treat, you, if they treat me this way, they're going to treat you the same. But it's not just that. I want you to see what it says in verse 11. You saw it, but let me read it again. It says, indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. Here's the point. That's the order. The order in your life is pain before perfection, groaning before glory, suffering before saving. Cross before empty tomb. That's the way it works. That's the way it's always worked. And it says, this is such an amazing message. I want you to look at how it ends. Verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then look at the very end of this. Verse 12, last part. Things, things meaning all the scripture said about Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Things into which the angels long to look. And literally it means the word would be obsessed. So think about it. The angels are perfect and you're not. The angels have lived longer than you. The angels are smarter than you. And they are obsessed with the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Partly because they don't understand forgiveness. They've not been forgiven. They were perfect. Humans are the only ones who have sinned grievously and been forgiven. They're amazed that God would send his son to die for sinners like you and me, and we should be amazed as well. We should continue to look at the gospel. The gospel is endless. The gospel is bottomless. It's not the ABCs of the faith. It's the A to Z. It's not the front door of the house of how you get in. It's the whole house. It's not the uh, diving board. It's the entire pool. That's the big idea with the gospel, and it's something that we need to continue to look at. Jesus Christ is not only, this is one of the unique things about the book of 1 Peter especially, that in the book of 1 Peter, Jesus Christ is not just the object of our faith, that's certainly what he is, he's, he's the person where we rest, we transfer trust and rest in him, but he is the pattern of our life. And we'll see that. It's going to say later, as Christ suffered, you also arm yourselves ready to suffer. Here's the big idea. Jesus Christ went through all the trials you're going through for you already. Here's what I mean by that. He went through physical trials. He was beaten and crucified. He went through relational trials. He was misunderstood by his family, rejected by his community, betrayed by uh, one of his friends, uh, and, and uh, the rest of his friends, uh, uh, disciples left him for a season. He went through emotional trials. He wept when his, friends, when his friend Lazarus died. He went through spiritual trials. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he took on the wrath of God. That what Jesus Christ did was he went through all of the trials for us already. And that's why, if you just look at one last verse here, if you look at verse 12, one more time, it says this, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Here's what it says. That when it comes to the gospel, the prophets predicted it, the angels ponder it, but only you get to preach it. And what's so powerful is we should always be preaching the gospel, right? We should always be talking about Christ and what he's meant to us and what the cross means and what the resurrection means and how we can be forgiven of our sins. But that is particularly powerful when you're suffering. You may see now your suffering or, or some trial you're going through as a unique opportunity to trust God in it and share the hope of God during it. Yeah. And it's going to have an influence and an impact that it wouldn't otherwise if you weren't faithfully trusting God in the midst of your trial. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for an honest, the Bible's so honest to tell us the trials that are coming into our lives. And it's not to scare us, but to prepare us. We need to be in community. We need to be reading our Bibles. We need to be walking with Jesus. We need to be worshiping. We need to know ahead of time that there is going to be a, per when the trials come, there is a purpose even when we can't see it. Lord, help us to believe that. Help us to believe that for one another. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in this room who would say, I don't have a living hope, that they would look up, Lord. They would look to you that they would see that their sins can be forgiven and that they can be born again. Lord, for the rest of us, I pray that we would 
all the things that are coming, that you would give us the faith to walk through them. To have a faith that in the middle of it, we say, I still believe, even though I don't understand everything. I still believe even though life's really hard. And you would give us an opportunity to share the good news we have with the people around us. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.